Please welcome to the stage Governor Josh Shapiro with LaSalle University basketball coach Fran Dunphy and the Citizens, Larry Platt. You're, you're much more enthusiastic for me than last time I was out here. <laughs> it was all for you, Larry. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome um, to this unique conversation, point guard leadership. I described it to these guys as a way to talk about leading folks, whether it's a state, whether it's a team of young men or girls, uh, leading them from a me mindset to a we mindset. Um, and uh, you may know Josh Shapiro as the governor of our state, but Josh was the starting. Commonwealth. I'm sorry? Commonwealth. Com Commonwealth. Thank you. We're, 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 we're going to. Facts matter, Larry. <laughs> it's already getting contentious. Uh, uh, but Josh was the starting point guard for Akiba Hebrew Academy's 1991 championship team. Uh, Why are they laughing about that? Well, I know. It, it, well, and so to give you guys some background, I just want to show, uh, of course, Fran Dunphy, the legendary, the, the winningest Big Five coach in history. Um, so let's show, let's show, uh, I think we have a photo of Coach Dunphy when, when he was a uh, point guard. This was a point guard, 1970, in, at LaSalle. And we have a quick clip of your governor uh -oh. on, on, on the hard courts. Let's see, uh, oh. let's see point guard Shapiro. Look at that, he's number 32, right there. Sun's out, gun's out right there, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> there he is. Look at that ball, those ball handling skills. Look at those short shorts, holy <laughs> cow. Here's the layup. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for picking that clip. Do you, know, do you know how many hours I had to watch of a Kibra Hebrew Academy? I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but actually, was one of your teammates Jake Tapper's brother? Was. I thought there was a Tapper. We, we had a Tapper on our team. Um, Ami Eden, who's a big Ami, journalist, yeah, Ami was Eden. on that team. We had a good crew. We won 23 straight games my senior year, and we won the championship. We beat Wing Code Academy. I'll never forget that. Uh, I thought I made a big time. The Philadelphia Inquirer ran a picture of our championship win, and I was guarding a guy with maybe the greatest mullet of all time, <laughs> who was a lot taller than me, but it had my name in the Inquirer and a box score, and we won the game. And that was really the... Um, the highlight of my career was all downhill, my sports career after that. Well, I had it uh, 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 in doing my research. Someone did tell me that you were like a Steve Kerr-like player, which, which that's high praise. So, high praise. Uh, and the other thing I want, so again, Fran Dunphy, the winningest coach in Big amazing. Five history, which amazing. is just a, an amazing uh, thing. But also, his team is 3-0 and right now. They play tomorrow. And then Tuesday night, you will be kicking Duke's ass. Yeah, you Duke. will. All right. We, sh we shall see. <laughs> Actually, I was here last week. Mike Krzyzewski was on this stage here speaking to a uh, Comcast group here. So it was really nice to, nice to see him in, in, uh, in other stuff that he does other than coaching. And to, uh, as far as the, the governor's concerned, I, in 1991, I recruited a young man by the name of Jerome Allen to go to Penn. I, I, I chose Jerome Allen over the governor, so. <laughs> My That's why he's the winningest coach <laughs> of all time in the Big Five. And that was a great Penn team with Jerome Allen and Matt Maloney. They were very good. My job was to get out of the way and leave them alone. Well, you, the reason I asked you to have this conversation is you've been, always been very thoughtful about leadership. And this really is a way to think about leadership. And. Uh, let's begin with me asking both of you, what is a point guard? What, is it, what, what do we mean when we say point guard leadership? And how has that philosophy affected uh, you going forward? 
go first, Coach. I can throw some ideas out there. I, I, uh, and I would s say it's something like this, Lair. Uh, when I was younger and I was much more insecure, I didn't appreciate the leadership coming from within the group like I do now. It's much more important in my mind to have that leadership come from the team rather than me as the leader. So now, <laughs> appreciate that. <clears throat> Now, I might, at the end of the, let's say there's, we have a timeout at four minutes to go in the game, scores tied, whatever. I am more apt to say to those guys who have the ball all the time in the game, what play do you want to run? Where do you want the ball? Where do you want that screen set? What do you want that guy to do? Where do you want, you want him to dive to the rim? Do you want him to pop for a jumper? What is it that you want him to do? I don't particularly care what it is we do or who gets, who wants to have the final say. What I care about is how we run that, whatever we're gonna decide on, how are we gonna run it, and that's, but I need to give more ownership, more empowering to those people that are actually on the court doing the work. That's great, and that's what a point, a point guard, you're, you're, you're really putting others, you're distributing the ball, you're the distributor, so that's, that, that's consistent. The hope is that he has the team first in his mind. And that's, and I think after years of working at this and then getting to know, the, there's that trust that's built up within those guys on the team. Do they make every decision right now? But then you sit down and talk about it and say, all right, let's watch it on film. And that's what we do. We, we watch so much film that says, this is a great play. That maybe I could have done it a little bit better here. So it's a great learning experience. Well, and Governor, the genesis of this idea was when I was watching you have the press conference about I-95, and you had that brilliant idea of the closed circuit TV where you could actually cheer on the laborers, and you publicly at the press conference said, this was the idea of Dana Fritz, my chief of staff. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second, most, I've never seen a politician by name give credit to someone else. I thought that was a point guard move. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why I reached out. I appreciate that. Look, I. And by the way, Dana Fritz is an outstanding chief of staff. We worked together for more than a decade, and uh, she's built an incredible team. Uh, and we're doing real good things for the good people of Pennsylvania every single day. I think um, being a point guard, and by the way, point guards look a lot different today than they did when I was playing, right? When, back in when I was playing and coach earlier on in your career, it was Mo Cheeks, that six foot three point guard. Today, it's the Joker, right, who's a point <laughs> center um, doing incredible things. But I think you've got to be the, the floor general. You've got to figure out how to involve everybody in what you're doing. You've got to recognize everybody's got a distinct role, and your job is to lift them up, empower them, give them an opportunity to succeed. In a weird way, as a point guard, and I certainly did not understand this when I was playing and younger, your job is to move incredibly fast, but in your brain be moving a lot slower than everybody else so you can see things that others don't see. And so when I think about my role as governor and when we get around the table in the Capitol and try and work through an issue or a plan or 95 or what have you, it's figuring out all the different people around the table and recognizing we each have a role to play and we have to play our role as excellent as we can, otherwise we're not gonna accomplish our mission. And I am one of the people with a role in that process. Dana Fritz, our chief of staff. Will Simons, our communications director, and the list goes on and on. Everybody's got a role to play, and your job as the point guard is to lift them up, empower them, make sure they know you got their back, you're gonna have their back in good times and bad, and you're gonna be the leader out on the floor. And so I think a lot of the lessons I learned from playing hoops, and I still try to play. I, I now, by the way, think slower about the game and <laughs> act slower when I play the game. But I, I think that's all, it, it, you know, the, that sort of sports approach has been really helpful to me as we've governed. And whether you agree with me or not on various issues, I, I think there's no denying the fact that we're putting a hell of a lot of points on the board and getting a lot done every day. And I think a lot of that is from our sports upbringing. It's interesting. So, and you're a big believer, we've talked about this for 20 years, in bipartisanship. Um, and I wonder how your sports acumen has helped, or hurt, either way, 
in terms of bringing that, those disparate voices together? Because there's nothing more meritocratic than a, than a sports locker room, right? So talk to me about, about that. I think actually you can use sports, similar to using food and arts and culture, as a way of actually just getting people to talk who otherwise wouldn't normally talk. If, if you want to approach solving a problem, particularly in my state where I'm the only governor in the entire country with a full-time divided legislature, meaning for me to get anything past coach, I need Republican votes and Democratic votes. Only governor in the country like that. And if you just sort of begin engaging with people on the other side on the underlying issue, when they've got really dug in hardened views that are different than yours, it's gonna be really hard to be successful there. So I try and use food and sports and engagement on culture, you name it, music, as a way to just find some commonality with folks, as a way to actually break down some of the barriers and begin the process of, of dialogue with them. And then when it comes time to actually solving the problem, kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning, in, in a sporting event, when you're on a team sport, everyone has an important role to play. And if you can help those on the other side of the aisle recognize you know, that they have an important role to play in getting this bill across the finish line or getting this issue resolved, and that I'm gonna empower them as part of that, right? I'm gonna make sure they get credit, that the people in their district know that they tried. Sometimes with Republicans, they don't want me to praise them. That hurts them. <laughs> <laughs> Other times they do, but the, the point is figuring out ways to both use sports to open up a dialogue and then continue to think about that team game and that team mentality when we're solving a problem. Is the age of big deal making over? In other words, uh, I thought that there was a, an, an obvious deal to be made here with vouchers in exchange for uh, 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 minimum wage. That, that would have been the deal 20 years ago. I remember when Ed Rendell uh, said to Republicans, uh, vote, vote for my education budget and I won't campaign against you in your district. Is that, am I wedded to a previous generation? A little bit, but, but I would say um, the age of big deal making is not over. And we've only been at this 10 months. We, we got a lot more time to go and we're gonna get a lot more big deals done. And by the way, we've already gotten a ton of big deals done. The, more funding for public schools than ever before, universal free breakfast, 400 more state police troopers, a billion dollars in new private investment in Pennsylvania, automatic voter registration. We ended crisis pregnancy centers in Pennsylvania to give woman, women the right to choose. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. We're speeding up government, but the, the bottom line here is that the, the, the big deal era is not over. What is different is what motivates different people when they come to the table. It is true that today versus 20 years ago, and you wanna talk about Ed Rendell, there's a lot more purity in the system, right? On the left and the right. And a lot more people who are in the system who maybe don't sort of see themselves there to actually get something done, but see themselves there as just, you know, looking for likes on social media or purity on a particular partisan test. That is not helpful. And by the way, we're seeing that play out in real time seemingly every day in the Congress of the United States where virtually nothing gets done. Um, I'm doing everything in my power to, to sort of pull people back from that in Harrisburg. And I think the, the list of things I just quickly rattled off that we've accomplished shows that we can do big things again in Pennsylvania and we can do it in a bipartisan way. And as I said before, nothing happens in Harrisburg unless I got Republican votes and Democratic votes and we've been able to do that on a whole host of serious issues. In preparation for today, I read or reread uh, this book, The Captain Class. It was a study about sports dynasties and leadership on sports dynasties, and it was by a Wall Street Journal reporter. And uh, there's some fascinating stuff in it, and it finds that great teams are not led by the greatest player necessarily, but by glue guys. Uh, the real leader of the Chicago Bulls in the 90s was not Michael Jordan. It was his co-captain, Bill Cartwright. Does that resonate? And coach, do you look for glue guys in recruiting? And governor, do you look for glue guys in hiring? Well, the glue guys are very, very important, but they also need those really good players to, <laughs> to, 
to win. They needed MJ to win, <laughs> win six rings. However, I think Bill Cartwright had an absolute role in all of this in terms of keeping that locker room quiet and, and, uh, and on, on focus and really understanding that uh, you have to play hard, but you have to be together as a team. Being a teammate is about as important thing as we all do. And all I would say that everybody in this room is a teammate of sorts, whether it's your family, your work, whatever it is, we're all teammates and we all have to do a great job with one another and putting the team first. I have a young man who plays for me now who doesn't play very much, but he's the most valuable teammate that we have because he's kind, he's considerate, he's can do no wrong in terms of helping his teammates get better. He's just a phenomenal kid. And uh, do we need him? Yeah, absolutely. But we also need those guys that are going to make shots and do a great job on defense and get the rebound and, and, uh, and listen to my nonsense that I spew on occasion. <laughs> I mean, I would say our team, if you look at our senior team, we're nearly all glue guys and gals, right? And, and I really value hard work integrity, um, lifting up your coworkers as opposed to trying to elbow them out so you get ahead. Or um, I create an environment where anyone on our team can speak up to me, challenge me, ask me questions. I like surrounding myself with people who disagree with me a lot more than I like surrounding myself with people who just agree with me. Um, Anytime we have a meeting and someone's like, oh, Governor, that was the greatest idea ever. I'm like, I go, well, first off, it was not the greatest idea ever. Second off, we don't need you here because you're not, you're not a value added. The value added you know, on our team are the folks that are challenging us. When you challenge me, when, when we challenge one another, then we actually get a better work product at the end of the day and one that's more reflective of the incredibly wonderful diversity of this great Commonwealth, Commonwealth of ours because <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting different opinions around tables. So I believe in surrounding myself with people from different parties, people who have different life experiences than me, uh, different genders, different races, different religions. I think all of that goes into getting a great team that's going to ultimately lead to a great product. And so I sort of consider all of us to be glue guys and gals in that process. Coach, will you share, you told me an anecdote when we spoke last week about a student of yours who you noticed didn't show up for a couple of classes. Yeah, uh, and it happened over the years. I've done this a lot at Penn and at Temple and now at LaSalle. And if I see a young person maybe miss a class on Tuesday and then it happens again on Thursday, I'm apt to then give them a call and say, listen, our class is not nearly as good as when you are there because you engage, you, you have thoughtful uh, thoughtful ideas that we can learn from. I need to learn from you. I'm like really selfish. I want to learn from you. And when you're there, we're a much better served class. And so I think those things are really important to just, and that young man typically would say, I, I just, I didn't think I had that kind of presence. And, and well, you do, you, you are very valuable to what we're trying to do here. And so I think those kind of little things can help bring the team closer together because everybody's on the same page. I loved that anecdote when you told me it because it really is about that whole uh, inculcating that we mindset. That's got to be the hardest thing in, in dealing with young athletes and also in dealing with super ambitious uh, uh, public servants who some of whom might, you know, you talked about the elbows, from some of whom might be thinking about what their next move, move is. Just the last thing I would say on this, uh, the other day we had a, a practice and our two guards who are really good players, but they're very heady players as well. And they ran this, this particular play in a set out of, uh, we were practicing, they run this set and I blow the whistle and I look at them and I say, what the hell was that? And they said, well, we just thought it would be a good idea if these two guys came off the screen and set a good double screen for our guy in the corner. I said, that was awesome. What are we gonna call it? And that's so it's going to be double down is what we're going to call it. We we ran it the other day successfully and we're going to run it again. And it's all to their credit because they saw it. And I would be foolish not to use that good idea that came from within the group. That's awesome. That was really cool. No one tell Duke about that play, but we need that to work. 
That part was off the record, okay? <laughs> else I love that because it's about sub, you, you as a leader sublimating your own ego uh, and, and using that as, a, as an object lesson, really. That's teaching. Um, and I, I, I wonder if there's, if there's an application of that in, in the job you now find yourself in. I think it's a lot of what I talked about before, creating an environment where your team feels confident challenging you, telling you that your assumption is wrong, offering data that maybe forces you to think about an issue differently, and, and having a spirited discussion where everybody feels safe sharing their perspective. I think that's really important, and I, I think it's kind of rare, frankly, in these jobs. Um, and I know a lot of elected leaders who, who don't view it the way I do, they'll say, look, I won the election, I've got a mandate, and uh, my way or the highway, and I want people around me who are gonna support my way. I just think my way gets better hmm. when you have people challenging you and forcing you to think about things different. I get better at my job because of the team I have around me who, who complement the work I do, who challenge me and make me better. You know, as a journalist, people give me their critiques all the time of public figures, and there's only one of you what, there's only one critique that you always hear, and I, have, I, have, I am on record as saying I think it's ridiculous, but I'm gonna get your response to it. And we've talked about this before, which is that you suffer from ambition. I don't know why that is a negative necessarily, but, but give us your response to that. I mean, I'm ambitious to get shit done every day. <laughs> That's like, why would you hire me if you don't want me to get stuff done for you? I don't know. It's true. Great. I, I will say, I mean, I understand kind of what's, it's like coded language, what's behind that, right? He's got his eye on something else. I, I will tell you, I've, I've been blessed that the good people of Montgomery County and Pennsylvania have given me this opportunity to serve in the state house as county commissioner, attorney general, now as the 48th governor of the Commonwealth. And um, I, I'm mindful that it is my responsibility to do a great job of this and to work hard every single day. And I really don't think about what's next or what comes tomorrow, what comes next year. If I do a really good job today, if I stay focused on the task I have for them, if I stay focused on being a good father and husband and staying, staying grounded and humbled in this process, um, then you know life tends to kind of work its way out. But um, I think ambition is a good thing if it leads to accomplishments for the people that you're supposed to serve. Totally, totally, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, I, I, Governor, you and I have bonded over the years on uh, the Robert Caro books about LBJ. So I wanna ask you about what, how that, that has informed your leadership. And, and Coach, I wanna hear from you about what either books or or what you would recommend to a budding leader to study in order to do the job right? Well, I, I had read a, a life-changing book for me, Tuesdays with Maury. Sure. Sure. Uh, Mitch Album. Mitch Album, a sports writer, of course, Detroit. Uh, Graduated from my high school. He did? Oh, that's that? right. How about that? Was, was, didn't, didn't play on the team, though. No, nah, he's <laughs> older than me. <laughs> but I think for, for me it was life-changing in that you know, I finally figured out that this thing is not has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the people that are surround you. It's not about you. It's about your team. It's about your family. It's about your friends. Whatever you can do for them, life is way better. And uh, one of the things that we talk about in leadership all the time is is giving the credit and taking the blame. When things don't go don't go well, it you got to jump up there. And and the other part that we talk about all the time is your character shows best in the dark, you know, when nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. What are you doing mm -hmm. when nobody's watching? And uh, so we talk about that all the time. The, the, uh, the kids, we, we give lessons at the end of every practice, and they, they, they say to me, oh, we got to listen to this again. Yeah, you do, because this is, <laughs> this is me, and I think there's a, there's a little nugget in there. Just take it for what it's worth, and this is after years of doing this, but it, it's about those young people that you get a chance to be with every single day, and to watch them do well and accomplish things is, is what we, why we do what we do. That's awesome. Caro. Caro. Robert Caro. I think one of the best 
uh, books ever written about politics and governing is Master of the Senate. It was about LBJ and um, when he served as majority leader and how he was able to get things done, including the Civil Rights Act, helping shepherd uh, parts of that through. He understood the power of persuasion. He understood the power of coalition. He understood that each person needed to be, you know, cajoled and coaxed, but also, you know, coddled at times too. And so with every person he confronted, with every issue he dealt with, he figured out that path forward. And I think sometimes in this business, the, the, the art of the deal or the art of the, the, the I shouldn't say the art of the deal, right? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the art of the, the politics behind getting the bill passed or whatever, can sort of be viewed as like a yucky thing, right? But the reality is we're supposed to be in this business to get stuff done. And the way our democracy works is you bring people together from different views, different parties, you advance that cause, you know, pass in the House, pass in the Senate, signed by the governor or president, and ultimately that's how you make progress in this nation. Then you get judged by the American people every few years or by the people of Pennsylvania every few years on, on how well you did. And I think that's the way the system's supposed to work. And Caro's book about LBJ sort of showed the, 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 the backside of that process. Now, I, I'm not sure my tactics are like LBJ's, <laughs> but, but I think it's interesting to learn how others use pow the power of persuasion to get things done. So in other words, you haven't, uh, uh, he was a tall guy and he'd go to the deep end of the pool where he could stand and have someone who was shorter <laughs> talking to him who had to tread water while they're, and, and, and that was a way to get, get his way. I don't do that. You, don't, you don't do the pool. He would like summon people to his bathroom and that's, talk that's to them right, while he was right. in that. No, I don't do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> don't. But we also talked about the, the JFK book, uh, uh, Profile in Power, right, which was also, and I remember JFK, after he took office, there was a note card on everyone's desk that said, uh, what have you done today to to uh, increase the GDP. Uh, that's leadership, and so c c communications is leadership also, right? After, when, when I-95 happened, y you saw, because I don't think you use a teleprompter, I think a lot of this stuff you just do, you, s you came up with this analogy of this is a sport, a championship moment. Can yeah. you talk about that? Because that's yeah. part of leadership, which also comes out of sports. Yeah, no question. Look, first off, just to set the table, right? I get a call from Dana Fritz, our chief of staff, I don't know, seven o'clock or so in the morning. I think it was Saturday or Sunday morning, if I'm not mistaken. I know it was the weekend. And you know, she said, I-95 collapsed. And I'm like, oh, when you say collapsed, you, you, don't mean like, <laughs> you don't mean like it actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it did, and, and um, we had to wait a little bit. It was frustrating. Um, we had to wait a little bit till the fire was out before we could sort of be out there, but we were out there that afternoon and, um, you know, really heard from the experts, the engineers and others, that it was going to take several weeks, if not months, really, to get this thing reopened. And I thought that this was an important moment for the city and the Commonwealth. Um, to believe in ourselves again and to show that we could do big things. I think this is a city that sometimes gets down on itself wrongfully. We have so many wonderful things going for us. And so I think it was important to not just challenge, as we were doing, the lawyers and the engineers to not take a week to do something I felt that they could do in an hour, and I gave them an hour and they did it, um, and not, you know, not allow others to um, sort of be let, let off the hook, if you will, for the challenge, right? So we knew our lawyers and engineers had their part to do. We, of course, knew the great Philadelphia Building Trades could do their part, and thankfully, they were willing to work literally 24-7 in order to get it done. But I thought that the city also needed to be a part of this, that we needed to feel some ownership of this. That's why we put the live stream up, so you could all see the progress we were making. That was in part because I wanted you to feel like you had some ownership and you were part of it. It was also in part because I wanted to see I wanted you to be able to see the incredible workers here in the city of Philadelphia who literally rebuilt this road in 12 days after they said it was going to take months. I wanted you to feel a sense of pride in that. This was a moment of civic pride. The, the nation's eyes were on us, quite mm -hmm. literally. And I wanted people to know Philly could do big things again. And I hope that that sense of civic pride is going to carry us through, uh, certainly with this great new mayor that we just elected in Sherelle Parker. And, <laughs> 
and all across Pennsylvania, I think we're poised to do big, great things again. And I think 95 showed what is possible when we're all, when we're all in it together. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Last question uh, uh, to, to uh, both of you, actually. Um, well, actually, to the governor first. You're also the leader of uh, the Democratic Party here in Pennsylvania. Um, and do you, uh, we're heading into a presidential election. Uh, do we have, or do you share my concerns about, we just had an election here in Philadelphia with 27% turnout, uh, which is shameful. Uh, and, and do you share my concerns about low voter turnout generally? I do. Look, I think it is my role as um, the governor, as the leader of the Democratic Party, to make sure that we are lifting up voices um, of people that have real lived experiences, people who are finding those in the community to get engaged in our politics and in our processes, and finding a way to make sure that we're lifting up people who have oftentimes been left behind, people of color, women, others who have not gotten a shot in our politics the way they should. So I view that as central to my political responsibilities. One of the reasons why um, I strongly endorse Kendra Brooks in the city council race. Someone who you know, we have, we have real differences on policy, but I thought her lived experience was valuable to have in council. Similarly, in the western part of our state, Sarah Inamorato, who won, um, became the first woman to lead the uh, Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is in the western part of the state. So we need to find ways to engage people like that and encourage uh, excitement in, in our electorate. It should be lost on no one what the data has shown us, though, over the last few years in Philadelphia, getting to the heart of your question. If you look at statewide voter turnout over the last few cycles, Philadelphia has been behind statewide voter turnout. Okay? And Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is, and the Philadelphia suburbs have been above it. Just look at what happened a couple Tuesdays ago. Philadelphia performed 5% worse in voter turnout than the statewide, and Allegheny County performed 5% better. The Philly suburbs were even better than that. Go back and look at 2022. Philadelphia was 13% behind the rest of the state. Think about this for a moment. I won with more votes than anybody in the history of Pennsylvania for governor in 2022. If you just simply had Philadelphia's turnout at the same level of statewide turnout, I would have had another 117,000 votes, assuming people voted you know, the way they had in, in all the other votes cast. Why am I raising this? Well, I guess you raised it. Why am I answering this? <laughs> Look ahead to 2024. 117,000 votes were lost in Philadelphia because the voters weren't turning out here. Hillary Clinton lost by 40,000 votes. Joe Biden only won by 80,000 votes. I think we have to wake up and realize that the way we conducted our politics on turnout in the city of Philadelphia in 2013 is not the way we need to conduct it in 2023, right? Think about this for a minute. Back in 20. 13, you had one election day. It was on election day. Today, folks are voting 45 days before election day by mail. Our politics have changed. And until we figure out how to engage more people, folks like Kendra, work to bring people in differently than we did 10 years ago, listen to young people who have loud and strong and important voices, and they not only need to be heard in our ballot boxes, but also when we govern. That's why I started a next-gen commission, and they now work for us in the state government. Then I, I'm worried about our future if we don't get them engaged. Philadelphia has a big test in 2024 to make sure we reelect Bob Casey and that we reelect the President of the United States and stop the chaos of the second term of Donald Trump. And the best way we can do that is by rethinking some of the assumptions we've had for a long time in Philadelphia about how voters turn out. Go look at the data. It's concerning. But I think that if we listen to more people, bring new voices in, embrace the great diversity both of, of opinion and traditional diversity in this city, 
then we can change that trend and we can move in a new direction and our democracy will be better for it. That's great. Uh, so I want to close on common ground, uh, on uplifting common ground. Can we all agree that Philadelphia is better off without James Harden, who is, who is, yes. who is, who is winless in Los Angeles? Uh, we're, 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 uh, Dump, you're, you look like you're, you're on the fence. I'm not really because I've watched Tyrese Maxey play over yes. the last... Yeah. And while, while he is seemingly an unbelievable athlete, it just every word that comes out of his mouth is well thought. It's all about the team. He's just terrific. He and Jalen Hurts, I, I don't know how we do any better than those two guys representing the city. Absolutely. So, I'm a voracious reader and I consume a ton of data, um, especially about sports and basketball. Every day I look at James Harden's plus minus on the Clippers. He is minus 13, which is fourth worst in the NBA. That warms my heart. <laughs> it warms my heart. Because this guy, 24 second shot clock, he would dribble for 16 or 18 seconds and then like give the ball to Joel in a position where he could not be as effective as, as he is. Getting rid of him increased our pace on the floor. Go look at our pace time. It's increased. It has made Joel a better player, Maxi a better player. Y'all are laughing at me. I'm serious about this. <laughs> and I think it's actually made Tobias a better player yes. too on the wing. He's catching and shooting the ball far more effectively. Guy's shooting literally over 50% from the field. It's incredible. And I'm optimistic, and I was saying the last couple nights, I'm optimistic about the Sixers' um, future, and uh, I'm really optimistic about the city of Philadelphia, and I'm especially optimistic about the citizen, thanks to Larry Platt. Uh, well, that, we're gonna end it there, because that's, that's high praise. Listen, I wanna thank these two great leaders, uh, really a lot of wisdom from them, and stick around for our final panel, the, the, the actual Fresh Prince of Philadelphia, a fascinating individual, Troy Carter. Thank you guys, we love you. Thanks for having us. Sir.